So we're going to continue our discussion on magneto reception. So far, we've seen uh, that if I start off with two molecules, A and B, and light shines on this molecular pair, H nu or HF, light comes in, and it excites the molecule A. So this aesthetic shows an excited state for the molecule A, and it eventually transfers an electron to B. So A is a donor of an electron, and B accepts the electron. So some kind of electron transfer takes place. So we have A, and this then acquires an unpaid electron, and also a negative sign because, oh, sorry, a positive sign because it has lost an electron. And at the same time, the molecule B also gets an unpaired electron and acquires a negative sign. So now we have two electrons unpaired. Each one of them carries a spin. Since the original pair of molecules had a singlet state, it started off with a singlet state. These two electrons will also start off in a singlet state. Yes. So now we have two electrons which start off in the quantum state, which we represented by S naught, and which is given by spin up on the first electron, spin down on the second electron, but you could also have spin down on the first electron and spin up on the second electron, and you'd also like to normalize. This is your singlet state. So you start off with a pair of radicals, a radical pair in which the two electrons are starting off in a singlet quantum state. And this is photochemically triggered. This is a reaction that can only take place in the presence of a photon, in the presence of a light signal. It enters the bird. So there has to be an organ where this reaction is taking place. Since it's a photoreactive reaction, the most likely organ is the eye. So in the bird's eye, there has to be, the proposal is, the conjecture is that there is a molecule, a pair of molecules, which is photo excited, and an electron transfer reaction takes place from one of the molecules to the other molecule, generating a pair of free radicals. A pair of free radicals means a pair of electrons. And those electrons start off in a single state. The spins have to be opposite to one another because that's what the original state of the two molecules were. As I mentioned that the chemical reaction in most cases preserves the spin order. You start off in a single state. And why do you need to start off in a single state? Because only then a bond is formed, a stable bond is formed with the two electrons which share the same region in space. They have to be in a single state. Otherwise, all the oxygen principle will not be satisfied. So now you have a radical pair located somewhere in the bird's body, most likely the eye, and that too in the retina of the bird's eye. And light shines on it. and a Reaction is triggered with a photocatalytic reaction. Light is acting like a catalyst, a photocatalytic reaction, and this radical pair is But this radical pair has a certain quantum form. All right. <clears throat> now I took a backtrack in the previous lecture and mentioned that I would talk about a single electron, just one electron spin. If I were to represent this a single electron by spin up. Then it responds to magnetic fields, just like any magnetic dipole moment would respond to a magnetic field. Now, if somehow I would 
we create a superposition of a single spin. Spin up and spin down. We talk about superposition, and I place this inside the magnetic field. Then this thing is going to change with time. It's going to evolve with time. Now, how do we explain this evolution? In order to explain this evolution, you have to involve the Schrodinger equation. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of the Schrodinger equation at this moment, but I'm going to describe to you what, what the process is. So, <clears throat> And I can show the process diagrammatically on, as I did in the previous lecture on a block sphere. Block sphere is a hypothetical sphere on which quantum states live. So I start and, and I represent the blocks in a manner that this, if I'm at the north pole, this is the state of the spin being up. This is the state of the spin being down. And on the equator, this point on the equator, just pointing towards you, is the superposition state plus head up plus head down. So I'm representing the quantum states on this sphere, on this hypothetical sphere called the blast. All right. Now what I do, suppose I place this quantum state a superposition of two states, spin up and spin down. I place this quantum state in a magnetic field, pointing up. And let's call, represent that magnetic field by some B naught. Now, under the impact of this magnetic field, this quantum state is going to change, it's going to evolve, change in time. So if the quantum state were pointing towards you on the block sphere, it's going to process, rotate, rotate, right? And when it rotates, the quantum state is going to change. It's going to evolve with time. Now the, short, the Newton's equation tells you how a system changes with time if a force acts on it. it, it it gives you the acceleration of the system. In an exactly analogous fashion, you're talking about quantum mechanics and quantum systems, it's the Schrodinger equation that drive, drives the dynamics of the quantum state. And the equivalent to force in the quantum picture is called a Hamiltonian. The equivalent to force in this picture is the magnetic field. This magnetic field is going to make the state evolve in time. And when it evolves, this superposition is going to change. And if I were to draw the processing quantum vector as a function of time, it's going to go around and around on the equatorial plane. So it's just going to change like this, right? Sort of process. And when it processes, the quantum state changes as well. So if I would draw a hypothetical line here and call this angle phi, phi being an azimuthal angle, Then this quantum state at some time, so this is quantum state at time t equals zero. Right? Talking about a single spin, by the way. At some later time, the state at some later time is going to be given by cat up plus some e i phi cat down over and over. So when time is such that this phi, which is a function of time, right? The time dependence is ingrained in this space. So the time zero, the phase is zero. The phase advances 
becomes 90 degrees when it reaches the east position. It becomes 180 degrees when it goes to the back position. 270 degrees. 360 degrees. Right? And in, in this manner, it just takes on all possible values between 0 and 2 pi. And the quantum state recesses, it evolves, and it cycles, it is periodic. The quantum state is periodic. It starts off here, after a certain time period, it ends up here. Two time period, it ends up here. So it's cyclic, it's periodic. At that time t, this is the quantum state. So if I were to choose phi, If I were to choose phi equals phi by two, the state would become psi plus iota. Get down, right? E i pi by two is iota. If my phi were pi, this state would become ket plus minus. E i pi is minus one. Right at phi three pi by two, I would get at plus minus i. And at phi equals two pi, I will recover the original state. And so on. So what is driving this precession? It's the magnetic field. If I switch off the magnetic field, the quantum state will remain where it is. So this magnetic field is acting like a force. It is providing the Hamiltonian for this precessional motion. And since it's a periodic function, it has to be defined by a frequency, omega. So it's processing with a certain frequency, omega. And it turns out that this frequency, omega, is proportional to the strength of the magnetic field. Stronger the magnetic field, higher will be the frequency. Right? If I were to talk about an electron, Right. So remember that this frequency, the precessional frequency of this spin, the spin is just a tiny magnet placed inside a magnetic field. And you can look at this picture from a totally classical perspective as well. A magnetic field is upward and the magnetic moment is pointing in this direction. There has to be a torque. The torque is mu cross B. So that torque is going to rotate the object. So if omega is proportional to B naught, this omega is generally called the Lamo frequency. Lamo frequency. We can also describe this by some constant of proportionality, gamma. This constant of proportionality is called the gyromagnetic ratio. And for an electron, a single electron, this is a fixed value. The fixed value for electron is about uh, I think 28 gigahertz per Tesla. So if you provide a magnetic field of one Tesla, it's going to process at the Lamo frequency of 28 gigahertz. So this is a picture of a single spin, single spin. Single spin ends here.
Now let's come back to our radical pair inside the bird's eye. A pair of radicals has been generated by a photochemical reaction. Now, as you can imagine, this is going to respond to the Earth's magnetic field. And by virtue of that, it's going to tell where the bird is and what direction is it headed into. What's the heading of the bird? Is it going north? Is it going south? Is it what magnetic? What uh, path is it taking on the magnetic map? But now we have two electrons and we have a singlet quantum state. That singlet quantum state is given at the top, S naught. How does this respond to magnetic fields? Okay, but the point is that this is a slightly complicated calculation for which you would have to know the shooting equation. And I can just give you the brief sketch of how this is done. The physics oriented students can look at this in more detail. If I have a quantum state at some time zero, and I want to find out the quantum state at some later time, Then, so let's go back to classical physics. If I have some position X, and I want to find the position, some position X naught, and I want to find the position at some later time X. So there is a relationship between X naught and X. So what is that relationship? So the relationship is simply d square x by dt square. This is the acceleration is equal to the force divided by the mass. So if I integrate this, I get x dx by dt is f over m dt, right? And I can integrate this further once again to get the position, all right? So that's how I would find out if I would to know x naught, I can tell what x is, okay? Now, exactly in a similar fashion, if I were to know the wave function of the quantum state at some earlier time, I can predict what the state is going to be at some later time. And that is given by the solution of the Schrodinger equation, which goes as follows. Initial state, state at some later time, and in between you have an operator, which is exponent minus iota, Hamiltonian time over h bar. Is this something that you've already seen in, in your modern physics course? So you have an initial quantum state and you want to predict what the state is at some later time. You just operate the initial state by an exponent of an operator. This operator H is called the Hamiltonian. This tells us how this state is going to evolve in time. And this Hamiltonian depends upon the magnetic field depends upon the orientation of the magnetic field, the strength of the magnetic field, and so on. So this is how quantum states evolve. Now you can plug in the singlet state here, which is the initial electronic state of the radical pair inside the bird's eye, and see how it evolves in time if you were to know what the Hamiltonian is. All right, so let's uh, take this argument a bit further. <clears throat> Any questions? I wish I had the liberty to do some more quantum mechanics because then this would become really, really interesting. Anyway, suppose I have 
a radical pair two electrons in a singlet state and this radical pair belongs to a molecule it's inside a molecule in fact it's inside a certain protein in the bird's retina that protein is called tryptochrome this radical pair has been generated inside tryptochrome and this is a cross section of the bird's retina inside the eye and the bird is moving in a certain direction therefore at a certain location there is a certain magnetic inclination the magnetic field is pointing in a certain direction suppose that magnetic field is pointing say in this direction b not now this is our static magnetic field the bird is at some location and at that location the geomagnetic field is pointing in this direction so it has a certain magnetic inclination and the premise is that the bird possesses a chemical compass this is a quantum mechanical chemical compass so the bird possesses inside now both of these spins they see the same magnetic field right because the, <laughs> i is a small organ right and the distance between these spins is so it's of the order of nanometer so the magnetic field hardly changes over the order of nanometer the earth field is really homogeneous it's a big magnet so it's a very uniform homogeneous field so there is no chance that these two electrons that are in the quantum singlet state psi not or s not this is the initial state of the radical pair they both of these electrons are seeing the same magnetic field and if both electrons see the same magnetic field they will not precess the idea is the reason for this is slightly complicated for this you need to know a little bit more quantum mechanics it's because the singlet state commutes with the hamiltonian of a uniform magnetic field but I don't want to go into this. I don't want to describe this. Anyone who understands this sentence, the singlet state commutes to the Hamiltonian. In other words, how could I explain this? The singlet state looks the same from whatever direction you look at it. whatever basis you choose to look look at the singlet state it's invariant it doesn't change it's spherically symmetric in other words it's like a football it's the same from all directions so in order to do something to the singlet state so that it evolves it changes just like the changes that we've seen in the single spin you have to put non uh, an inhomogeneous field that is the two you have to ensure that the two electrons see different magnetic fields but the earth the answer does not lie in the earth's magnetic field because the earth's magnetic field is the same for these two spins so you have to introduce some kind of inhomogeneity which means that the two electrons see different effective magnetic fields now there is one field which is bathing the entire earth that's the geomagnetic field but the answer does not lie in the earth's magnetic field there has to be some other source of magnetic field that these electrons see do you have an idea where that other source of magnetic field could come from if the answer lies within the molecule somewhere inside the molecule think about magnets these electrons are magnets are there any other magnets inside the molecule inside the radical pair hmm 
charge particles all the electrons are all, all the other electrons are playing a totally different so it's spin is zero so you need to have some other particle that has a spin right are there other particles inside the molecule inside the protein that can have spin what are organic molecules generally made up of carbon ji abhi nahi abhi chal main kar lunga ab idhar hi rehna oxygen oxygen hydrogen is yahan pe so is it carbon organic molecules have carbon but the most abundant isotope of carbon is carbon 12 carbon 12 has six protons six neutrons and of course six paired electrons all of these nuclei if you look at the nuclei six protons and six neutrons it imparts a spin zero to the carbon 12 nucleus right the carbon nucleus is spin i equals zero now i'm representing the spin of a nucleus by the letter i i can represent the spin of an electron by the letter s and the spin of the nucleus by the letter i so carbon 12 which is the abundant isotope in natural systems doesn't have spin carbon 13 on the other hand is an isotope whose abundance is about 1% it has seven neutrons and six protons this has spin and it's a spin half particle but it's not very abundant right its abundance is only 1% on the other hand the organic molecule is rich with hydrogens protons hydrogen nuclei are protons so a nucleus of a hydrogen atom is also a spin part is also a spin half part because it's just a proton a proton also has spin so the proton has spin one half identical to the spin quantum number of an electron so the proton also has angular momentum just like an electron so the proton also acts like a tiny dipole a tiny magnet so now you have these two electrons in the radical pair which are crucial to magneto reception but these electrons are surrounded by many protons and those protons each one of them has spin one half so each proton that the electron sees is also a tiny magnet what happens when two magnets come close to one another the tiny protons the tiny dipoles from the protons also have a magnetic field so the net magnetic field that this electron sees is a combination of b not the earth magnetic field and say so there is another proton inside the molecule and this produces its own magnetic field at the location of its electron say b i 1 and it produces a magnetic field at the location of this electron in some other direction b i 2 now the net resultant magnetic field at this location is going to be different from the magnetic field at this location correct this interaction of the electron with the nuclei is new interaction that you might have not seen before it's called the hyperfine interaction this is the interaction between electron and a neutron oh sorry electron and a nucleus so this hyperfine interaction imparts a differential magnetic field on the location of the two electrons in the radical pair so each electron is now seeing a differential magnetic field a different magnetic field 
a new resultant is evident to each electron. And each electron is now going to process under the impact of its effective field. And the singlet state is going to process into a combination of singlet and all the three triplets. So you start off with a singlet state, S0, and after some time, you get a combination of S0 plus E0, which is a triplet state, and possibly other triplets, T1 plus DT minus 1. And these A, B, C, D are complex coefficients. So this singlet state is now going to evolve with time. So it's going to go into combination of all the triplets and it's going to oscillate between the singlet and the triplet state just in a manner similar to what we've seen for the single spin in which you have an oscillation between up and down, up plus iota down, up minus down, up minus iota down. So you get an oscillation. So you get an oscillation between the singlet and the triplet states. Okay. So how do I represent this? So I started off with A, B. I photo triggered this. I excited A. Electron transfer took place. Electron transfer. I get a radical, free radical A, positively charged plus a free radical B, negatively charged, starting off in the trip singlet state S or S naught. And then I have interconversion between the singlet and the triplet state A plus. So triplet. So I can have all three kinds of triplets, T naught, T1, T minus one. So I have interconversion between the singlet and the triplet states. And this is going to occur because of the hyperfine interaction. And the frequency of this oscillation, just the Lamo frequency of this oscillation between the singlet and the triplet state is going to depend upon how strong the Earth's magnetic field is, what direction is the Earth's magnetic field in, and how strong are the hyperfine interactions. So the Earth's magnetic field direction slips into the picture in a somewhat indirect fashion. It sneaks into the picture. Just the Earth's magnetic field is not sufficient to enable the singlet to triplet conversion. You have to have anisotropic hyperfine interactions to enable this interconversion of the singlet and triplet states. But the frequency of this oscillation would depend upon the direction and inclination of the Earth's magnetic field. Questions? Now what's going to happen is, like any other chemical reaction, reactions are also reversible. So if this sing, in this single state, the electron can be captured back by the molecule, by the radical A. So it has donated an electron to B to form a radical pair, but it can always capture the electron back and form this, this thing back again, right? So remember that this is also in the singlet state. So here we have an electron transfer. It's also possible to have this electron captured back by A. And the reverse reaction can also take place. And every reaction has a certain rate. You must have studied this in CAM 101. Every reaction occurs at a certain rate. K, the rate constant for that reaction. So suppose the rate constant here is Ks. So this singlet state, this radical pair can recombine into a simple 
dimeric molecules into where it started off with. So, and this is in the singlet state. So you can end with this reaction. You can interrupt this singlet to triplet interconversion. You can interrupt it by having the singlet or the triplet mixture go back into either the singlet product or this triplet complex can form a new product, which is in the triplet state, in which the electrons are in the triplet state. So you can have a triplet product. And this reaction proceeds at the rate kT. So this is the overall mechanism of the chemical reaction in simplistic terms. And I can draw this uh, in, a, in, a, in a somewhat easy to understand fashion. Suppose you have two tanks here. And there's a possibility of transfer between the two tanks, transfer of fluid between the two tanks. And here's another tank. Here's another tank. All right. So this is the singlet side and this is the triplet side. We, they, these are the reactants. And here we have the products. Singlet S and T. There is a valve that connects the singlet to triplet interconversion. But at any stage, either of these reactants can go back to the... So new products are being formed. Singlet to triplet interconversion is taking place at the electronic level. But at any point, this triplet state can form a molecule, a product then this product is irrecoverable. It does not participate in any reaction. It can go back from the product to this point, unless a new photon comes in. This triplet can also go back. There's some pathway that this triplet can form a singlet product as well. The singlet can form a singlet product directly. Right? So this is a kind of... Uh, and each one of these processes is controlled by a valve. So this is a KT valve. This is a KS valve. And this is the possibility of a KST valve. So eventually when equilibrium is established and we know what the, these rates are and where you're starting off with, you can find out in a particular amount of time, how many single products are formed and how many triplet products are formed. You can calculate the singlet yield and the prod and the triplet yield in a certain amount of time, depending upon what this frequency is, this interconversion frequency, which depends upon the Earth's magnetic field, which depends upon the size of the hyperfine interactions, which depends upon the inclination of the Earth's magnetic field. So the Earth's magnetic field has the handle here, but the Earth's magnetic field can only operate can only make the singlet triplet conversion possible if there is an inhomogeneous or in, in isotropic or a differential hyperfine interaction of the two electrons with their neighboring nuclei. That is, the two hyperfine interactions must be differential. In the presence of a differential hyperfine interaction and a constant Earth's magnetic field, 
different singlet and triplet product yields will be formed. Different amounts, different concentrations of singlet and pro triplet products will be formed. Now, those singlet and product triplet have to control the ion transport in the cell, which controls the signal that goes on to the brain. Now I have one or, one or two slides which I cannot draw here, which I need to show you on on, a, on the computer screen. But any questions up to this point while I operate the so basically this is a <laughs> Popular lecture that I gave, so I'm taking some slides from over there. A lecture that I gave to the applications of quantum mechanics in biology to a very general audience in Urdu. So basically, I've tried to show that quantum mechanics plays a role in biology. Generally, when you talk about biology, it's something which is macroscopic big and something that is warm and complex. Quantum mechanics, on the other hand, is generally uh, the realm of the cold and the small. But here we've seen that in a bird's eye, quantum mechanics has an important role to play. And this is one of the triumphs of quantum mechanics, that it's now stepping into biology. And the next lecture, I'm going to talk about another aspect of this and that is sniffing how do we smell and for that we need to know a little bit about phone horns and quantum mechanical tunneling but we'll come to that in the next lecture so i talked about birds migrating from one place to another okay in fact the act of tracking the navigation of these birds is also fascinating and i would recommend highly recommend that you read the book life on the edge Life on the Edge by Jim Al Khalili and another co author. The fascinating account of how monarch butterflies that originate from Canada were found in Mexico and how thousands of volunteers did this tracking exercise 50, 60 years ago. Now, thanks to RF technology, uh, the process becomes quite easy, but it's a fascinating account. Now we know that these animals migrate from the cold regions to the warm regions in early winter time. And then they go back. And when they go back, since it's a very long journey, it's not the same birds that eventually reach back. It's their second generation, third generation birds that reach that. So even if the parent knows how to do a quantum mechanical compass, the children also know how to do the quantum mechanical compass. So this quantum effect is hereditary as well. It passes on from one generation to another. And when these birds go back, they repeat the cycle, the generations to come repeat the cycle uh, every year. And the answer lies in the Earth's magnetic field. And the Earth has a magnetic field has a certain inclination. And the compass in the bird's eye detects this inclination. So it can't tell the North Pole from the South Pole, but it can tell the poles from the equator. So it's, it can tell, it, uh, it can differentiate across the latitude, but it cannot differentiate across positive and negative latitudes. All right, so it depends upon the inclination. And the answer lies in the spin of an electron, which is a quantum mechanical phenomenon. And in order to have the spin on an electron, you need to have electrons and you need to have unpaired electrons. Because if electrons are always there, but they're mostly paired up, the spin is adds up to zero. So you need to have some mechanism of generating an unpaired electron. And that mechanism lies in a photon, a signal from the environment, entering the bird's eye and hitting the retina and exciting a molecule and forming a pair of radicals. Those pairs of radicals have two electrons and they're in a certain quantum mechanical state, singlet. That singlet can interconvert to the triplet state 
and that amount of interconversion depends upon the direction magnitude of the earth's field but the necessary requirement is that it has to have a differential hyperfine interaction with the neighboring hydrogen nuclei and when singlet and triplet states are interconverting they can form products they keep on forming products at certain rates and the kind of product that is formed that perhaps mechanically opens or closes an ion channel we talked about voltage gated channels here we have mechanically gated ion channels that that, that give signals to the brain all right and i it's a very interesting slide at the end the answer lies in this molecule which is called cryptochrome okay just need access to a laser pointer just give me a second please to get a laser pointer a laser pointer then this molecule here cryptochrome also controls circadian rhythm the day and night cycle of most animals including humans this is a very important molecule and it's the power of this molecule is is just coming uh, to the light so this is the molecule a structure of the molecule and if you look at what's happening how this electron transfer is taking place the molecule has four important sub parts which are involved in this photo triggering process there is a flavin part f a d a flavin molecule a flavin molecule has electrons in a singlet state and there are three amino acid derivatives called tryptophans inside the same molecule now what happens i'm going to show this on the blackboard what happens is that light comes in light is shown a single photon comes in and an electron is excited from the flavin part and it leaves a vacancy here that vacancy is filled up by electrons hopping from one by one in three steps from the three tryptophan molecules so an electron transfer takes place along a chain it's a molecular wire inside the cryptochrome molecule the electrons hop from one tryptophan to another to the third one and finally to the flavin molecule and two lone pairs of electrons are formed i'm going to show this on the blackboard in a minute okay so once on on the blackboard so far i've shown the overall mechanism but there is a biophysical process in in the background as well and how does this cryptochrome then control the vision of the bird so in fact the bird is seeing the magnetic field so this is a, is a, is an apt statement the bird is seeing the magnetic field the magnetic field is being sensed through a visionary visual perception well this is a this is a great idea for a final year project as well if you could do the quantum mechanics for this which is by the way very simple if you just know the schrodinger equation you could write a computer code and see and simulate what the bird sees when it is moving from that to 80 degrees to 70 degrees 70 degrees to 60 degrees in north east to the northwest section you can simulate what the bird sees this is a really beautiful project for a final year thesis and then what's what's going on so this is just hypothetical or conjectural but there is strong evidence that this is how this process is taking place how this singlet triplet product is controlling the signal that is going through the optic nerve to the brain here is the eye here is the eye the retina this is where the action is taking place a photon comes in is a close up view of the retina these are the retinal cells inside the retinal cells we have two kinds of photoreceptor cells that are called called the rods and the cones now the rods and the cones are connected to in layers of retinal cells horizontal cells bipolar cells 
amacrine cells, ganglion cells, and the ganglion cells then bunch up together to form the optic nerve, which is a nerve that transports the action potential, talked about action potentials, to the brain. So the magnetic field is controlling the action potential. We have a magnetic field gated opening and closure of ion channels in the cell membrane. So far, we've talked about voltage gated ion channels. Here we have magnetic field controlled ion channels. Now, if you move from B to C, look at a rod cell. The rod cell comprises discs, which could be five to 10 nanometers thick, spaced apart by five to 10 nanometers. And this is a close up of the discs. This is our cell membrane, a disc membrane, another disc membrane. This is a cryptochrome molecule sandwiched between two cell membranes. And when a product is formed, the singlet or triplet product is formed, it interacts with the rhodospin molecule, the rhodospin protein, which resides inside the membrane and controls the opening and closing of the membrane. And the degree of opening and closing depends upon whether the cryptochrome is in the singlet product state or the triplet product state. And that controls the amount of signal that goes to the brain, the frequency of signals that is going to the brain. And that controls whether the bird sees something bright or something dark. So it's a mechanical interaction, most likely, or an electrostatic plus mechanical interaction between the cryptochrome molecule and the rhodospin molecule that is controlling the opening and closure of ion transport channels across the cell membrane which in turn controls the signal that is transduced to the brain through the optic nerve. So this is an example of what the bird might see in different orientations. When, it is, when its head is facing the north, this is what we humans would see in, a, in an image. And this is what the bird might see. This is, of course, simulation work, depending upon singlet and the product yield and, and based upon a physical model, very similar to the model that I've described. So heading northward, the bird sees an arc of light, which is shaped symmetrically. Northeast, it tilts towards down to the right slightly. West, it tilts down towards the left. And if the bird is moving southward, you would take the mirror image of these simulated patterns. So it is very likely that the bird in its motion on the geomagnetic plane is its vision, the brightness and darkness is being modulated by the singlet and triplet products that are formed through this quantum mechanical reaction, which in first place is triggered by light. And the, and the thing is that when the bird moves in different geographical regions, the orientation of this magnetic field is going to change. When the orientation of this magnetic field changes, the Hamiltonian changes, and the singlet product triplet yields change. And they will affect what the bird sees. By the way, these molecules have to be immobilized. They cannot move because if you have random motion of these molecules, then this directional effect is all going to wa be washed away. So these molecules have to be fixed, aligned, or immobilized in the bird's retina. Otherwise, the orientational dependence will not come into force, come into play. So this is how I wanted to describe uh, how a bird finds its way on the planet Earth. In the next lecture, which I think is going to be the last lecture of this class, I'm not sure, but let's see. Uh, we're going to discuss quantum sniffing, smell. Smell is another important 
sense. By the way, this is the sixth sense. We don't know about any animal so far. Before I read this, I wouldn't know that you'd also sense magnetic field in such an acute and perceptive manner. This is like a sixth magnetic sense. But in the last lecture, I'm going to talk about one of the five senses, the sense of smell. And that too has a quantum mechanical explanation. Right, so do you have any questions? So there's a vast body of literature on this subject. So what I've tried to do in these two lectures is try to come, just look at all that, all that body of knowledge and simplify this in a manner that it's amenable for a hundred level course offered to some very motivated students. Many of them who don't come to class, but thank you very much.